Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Z. I'm a clinical psychologist specializing in transgender care. Welcome to my channel and welcome to your Monday's Q&A. This is the place where I answer your direct and specific questions as long as it is not diagnostic and can be generalized in nature. I have a list of six random questions. If you do have questions for me, feel free to email it to uh, info at Dr. ZPHC. The email is also in the description box. I keep everybody's name and information completely private. Uh, so feel free to email. Like I said last time during the last Q&A, I am having less questions in my Q&A folder. So I'm going to start facing them out every two weeks. Um, and then if you don't see one coming up, after the time that means I don't have any questions and that's actually a good thing that means everybody's doing well and don't have any questions to ask having said that um there's going to be timestamps below for the topics we're talking about today and let's get going so today's uh first uh question for today I have a question I am trans woman who is well along in transitioning I've been on hormones for about three years and recently had bottom surgery as I've transitioned my gender euphoria has increased, but so has my gender dysphoria. The dysphoria is related to the masculinity I still see, such as bone structure, voice, etc. This seems to be leading to a cascading desire for more and more change. I'm working on finding a balance, but I'm curious if others have experienced this and how they approached finding that balance. This is an excellent question, and if others have experienced this, please comment below so this uh, a viewer who has asked this has some feedback and support from all of you and I will would love to go ahead and offer you some feedback as well. Um, I have seen this in my private practice with individuals where as they go through their transition there is a, spar a spike of euphoria as they start feeling much better. At the same time there's also can be for some individuals um, on par with that feeling of euphoria, a feeling of ongoing or even increased dysphoria, when they still feel like there's parts of themselves uh, that to them are strongly associated with masculinity, uh, strongly don't resonate with them, and strongly makes them feel like they still have an element of their gender assigned at birth. And that can be very, very challenging. What I do recommend is when I see people that describes that feeling of dysphoria in a way you describing it, where you say that it's leading you to cascading desire for more and more change. I, when I hear that, I personally encourage you to slow down and to pull back because this cascading desire can bring a lot of emotions that are can really model things for you. And I have seen individuals who went down the rabbit hole of having surgery after surgery after surgery, and that takes a toll on their psychological and as well as um, overall physiological well-being. So it's really, really important when you feel like you have that strong need, that's an indication that, okay, pull back, the dysphoria is really taking a hold of you, and let's assess the situation, let's really look down and dissect these feelings. For a lot of people, what happens is, is that they have such strong associations to certain parts about themselves as being masculine, when in reality, objectively, it may not be so. So there could be, um, in a way, a distorted perception of how one sees themselves versus how they actually are. On the other hand, it could be not a distorted perception. It could be a very realistic perception. And as a result, that continues to cause a lot of struggle. Regardless, I still recommend to just kind of slow down and assess. I think at some point it's really important to uh, take a break from things that are transition related to give you a pause, to breathe, to kind of come into your own, to um, even dive deeper into yourself. I think it's really important. So I'd recommend for that balance is a tricky part uh, when it comes to dysphoria. When there's parts of yourself you still see and you associate them with masculinity, you identify as somebody who is masculine individual and it's really increasing the dysphoria. So balance can be a really tricky part. It also comes down to understanding that those elements of masculinity are also present in individuals who are uh, female identified, individuals who identify as women. Um, not all individuals who are feminine are 
thousand percent feminine there's no such thing everybody cares a shred of masculinity um, so it's one of the things also is recognizing that those things are present in all individuals so um, that's what I would recommend pull back a little bit um, and sit with really trying to dissect how much of this could be just distorted perception how much of this is actually not distorted perception because surgeries are I, I, I've seen it where surgeries, we, we think, I've seen people where they think that surgery is going to be it, it's going to be the solution, it's going to make everything better and everything is going to um, normalize and dysphoria is going to completely go away. And for a lot of people, the dysphoria is still there and it does help with feeling incongruent, but a lot of tradition uh, work is really internal work to internal integration, interning, internal acceptance of the self, internal uh, way of uh, embracing yourself. That's also a huge part of transition. So that's what I would recommend. But anybody else who, who are experiencing the same thing, please share below. How did you, you were able to find balance? How did you find the balance uh, and offer recommendations? But this is a really great question and I really wish you all the best. Second question for today. I've just started dressing as my true feminine self almost daily now, going from once a week. So you were doing it once a week, now you're going to almost daily. I've noticed my dysphoria increases the more I dress up. I think it's because I get used to looking feminine and start seeing the masculinity. But when I dressed up once a week, there was a spike in femininity each time. So it gave me gender euphoria instead. Does that make sense? How would I combat this? Makes perfect sense. And there could be what could really be happening is two things. One, you went from um so you you increased your your feminization, you increased basically the other way to put it is, and a better way to put it, is that you increased visibility, visibility of your authentic self to daily. Um, and when you increased the visibility, in other words, you decided to show up. As yourself every single day when you did that one of the things that could be happening is you started to notice now that you're seeing yourself as your authentic self you're also noticing things about yourself that are not your authentic self meaning things related to gender assigned at birth such as for you will be the masculine traits and as a result it also starting to cause you dysphoria Another thing that could be causing the increase in dysphoria from going through doing this once a week to doing it every single day is when we start showing up as who we are, as our authentic self, we start experiencing ourselves as our authentic self. As we do, we also oftentimes, a lot of people do, they start realizing also things that they need to do in order to fully live their life as authentic selves. And I don't know where you at if you're doing this just in the privacy of your home but for a lot of people they do it in the privacy of their home and then they realize what they also have to do is now oh i have to go through social transition or i have to um change my name I, in other words i have to now really live as myself not just in a privacy of my home but uh, out in the world and that in of itself is overwhelming and when things starts to feel overwhelming they will increase a sense of dysphoria so that would be another thing that is going on um, this is also why when you then scale back and you do it only once a week, the reason why you feel like you saw a spike in femininity and increase in gender euphoria instead of dysphoria is because once a week, what happens is one day out of seven days, you show up as yourself, but six days you hold yourself back. So six days when you hold yourself back. The dysphoria, you probably most likely feel dysphoria whether you wear it or not. So the dysphoria is there and it's really pushing on you. So on a day when you actually show up as yourself, you release, you're allowed to let that fuse to go out. Um, and because that fuse goes out, you re re release the pressure. That's a better word. You release the pressure. And once you release the pressure, you start feeling better. And that's where the euphoria comes in. So that's explaining to you what might be going on. It's not a matter of combating it. I, what I'm hearing you doing is a little bit of yo-yoing, right? You're going from once a week to every single day, but then every single day is uncomfortable. It brings up dysphoria, then you go back to uh, once a week. Uh, what I recommend is just sit down with yourself and see if you can commit 
to yourself. Remember, committing to ourselves doesn't have to be a whole shebang. It doesn't have to be, oh my God, I'm going to, uh, I have to come out immediately and I have to tell everybody and I have to change my name and I have to have all the surgeries. No, committing to yourself could be just sitting down and putting together uh, some tangible, realistic um, plan forward toward um evolving into yourself because it's clear from here that once you step into yourself once you evolve into yourself you feel that much more comfortable so that's what i would recommend just think how you can stop yo-yoing and just commit to to this part of yourself that is obviously there and makes you very happy so that would be my recommendation and anybody else please chime in and share your thoughts good question question number three Hi, how does this body work in non-binary? Grammatically, they is wrong for a person. I don't make rules. I, I think perhaps the English could be a second language from the way it reads. So um, I don't make rules. I understand trans women who are biological males have more white matter, which biological cis women have, and biological males have more gray matter than white. I can't understand non-binary. How does their brain look like? Okay, so this person is referring to few studies that have been done studying uh, brain patterns of uh, cis individuals and also trans individuals. And they found that uh, trans uh, women individuals had, you know, particular, particularly aspects of brain matter. So this is what they're referring to. They're referring to this one particular study and they're saying that they're having a hard time understanding how this non-binary brain works um, because I don't believe there is a brain study on non-binary individuals. But let, let me just read the question. Being trans woman or trans man is neuro, neurobiological, but not non-binary. Okay, so what you're also saying is that being trans, uh, trans in general is never biological, but uh, non-binary identity is not, the origin is not in the brain. Then it makes binary trans people look delusional to those on the right because left keeps on expanding gender into a spectrum, which it ain't. <laughs> There's both X and sperm. There is no in-between XY, XXY. is same male XX and X are male, a same female. I'm not saying that non-binary people do not exist, but want to know how gender dysphoria affects and what to know why they have no particular brain structure when trans women and trans men do. I also want to know about gender dysphoria in detail. I'm sorry I made you feel that I was rude to you. <laughs> I so want to prove the right wing in gender dysphoria. Okay, you're not being rude. You're trying to understand. Um, and the issue that I see with the question uh, and the way you're approaching the question is you sounds like you're approaching from a position that trans individuals and transgender identity is solely, solely neurobiological phenomenon. And you're using those very few studies to anchor that as solely, solely uh, neurobiological phenomenon. And so studies, by the way, were very small. They studied a small group of individuals, and it cannot be generalized to the whole population of trans individuals. Having said that, also, it sounds like the position that from which you are articulating yourself is a position that because it is never biological and because trans women have a brain matter that matches the cis females brain matter, therefore it means that they were born with wrong brains, right? Then you're making the argument that the binaries, the sex binaries are exist and gender is anchored to those binaries and within that argument it sounds like you're having a hard time understanding where do non-binary individuals fit in because they don't have those neurobiological studies um, then it sounds like they just came up with this gender idea if it's not neurobiological then what is it my um my counter uh proposition to what you're proposing or what you're asking here is one to recognize that not all trans people and i'm not talking about non-binary individuals but trans people specifically not all of them have brain matter that major cis individuals um, so that's one that already means that we cannot generalize the studies that we do have and two neurobiological origins that um, may explain um, a phenomenon such as gender dysphoria that people go through is just one of the many, many origins. There's many things that are responsible and can explain how an individual may form and come into uh, having a transgender identity. So that is not the only sole explanation. That's one of many explanations. And I do have a video talking about it. 
Now, having said that, um, gender, absolutely, in my opinion, is a spectrum. And I think the problem here, the challenge here is that um, you are anchoring it to the sex, which you don't see as a spectrum, which is in a way one can easily argue that it is also a spectrum. But for the sake of this argument, um, sex, and in this case, we also have to be mindful which form of sex are we talking about. We're we talking about chromosomal sex. What exactly are we talking about here? So it's really important to to know that um, you know gender absolutely is without a doubt um is not only a spectrum but it is a spectrum based on social perceptions and constructs biological sex being a part of so it does play a role in it but it's not black and white um how to explain and i think a lot of not i think but i find that a lot of trans people themselves struggle with understanding non-binary identities um I think what's more important to recognize that while we, some people like yourself may struggle with understanding, it doesn't mean that these individuals don't exist nor have valid identities. And I, I'm glad that you said that you're not saying that they don't exist because they do, but you're trying to understand. Um, it's a full spectrum of really understanding all of the manifestations of gender dysphoria is going to continue throughout the humankind. And with every uh, historical context, it is going to shift and going to be modified, just like right now we live in a historical context where already gender dysphoria has been brought and our understanding of it has shifted uh, from where for individuals to, to qualify as, as struggling with gender dysphoria, they had to have this very classical narrative of being trapped in a wrong body and really hating their genitals, which they even know no longer really holds true for a lot of individuals. So that is going to be an ongoing involvement of understanding gender dysphoria. What I do know for a fact is that non-binary individuals, um, not only the wild identity, but they absolutely do struggle with gender dysphoria because non-binary individuals are individuals who are not exclusively identified as male or female. And that non-exclusivity is a kind of a, um, the key component, the important ingredients of non-binary individuals' identities. And living in society where society still solely genders you based on one or the other is going to bring up dysphoria in individuals who don't identify exclusively as one, or the other. Um, so I wish I could answer your question maybe better. Maybe you were expecting me to have some um, neurological studies that have been done on non-binary individuals' uh, brains that I have, I'm not aware of. But I don't think that everything has to go down to um, necessarily uh, this neurological studies components. We really need to understand and start uh, divorcing ourselves from things such as necessarily having a strong biological rooting fact and understanding that gender dysphoria has multi-facets to it and has multi-dimensions to it and it um, not only affects everybody differently but it manifests differently so that's what I got to say um, I welcome anybody else um, to chime in, especially those of you who enjoy reading uh, studies and research to chime in and to offer you feedback, uh, feel free to do so. Question number four. Hey, Natalia, I am now coming to terms with being non-binary, and I'm wondering about something about it. <laughs> Is it normal for some non-binary people to not experience dysphoria as some do? For me, I only get it here and there over certain body parts and even my hair when told I should cut it short. Leaves me feeling very unhappy with the idea that just anxiety fails. Is it normal for to feel no dysphoria at times for some? Yes, this is a, a great question. And absolutely, um, gender dysphoria is, listen, gender dysphoria is not something that um, has a set pattern for certain gender identities. We can't say that for trans women, gender dysphoria will go through A, B, C, D, E points because each individual is different and each trans woman is going to feel gender dysphoria differently. The same way it applies to non-binary identified individuals. For each person, the dysphoria is going to interact with you um, in, in your own relational way based on numerous, numerous factors, such as uh, the amount of distress you feel the amount of um, 
attunement you actually feel versus denial to the distrust you experience, uh, your cultural context, where you're living, uh, what is social surrounding you, and how is society also interacting with you based on your identity, your support system, other, are there other maybe uh, mental health conditions that you're struggling with? Are there other elements that you also struggling with? There's going to be a multitude of things that are all going to affect how this worry is going to uh, manifest within your life. And it's going to change from day to day because your surroundings and your circumstances may change from day to day. And an individual that is in a very supportive environment um, and wakes up and is met with, with support and love and care is going to have a very different level of dysphoria than an individual that wakes up isolated and in not supportive environment and in an environment that is also hostile and toxic. So a lot of things are going to affect, but it's very normal for dysphoria to fluctuate. It will fluctuate. It has no pattern. It has no time frame. Um, and a lot of factors go into it. Why do you feel it one day and why you don't? And this is why for so many who experience it, it is so, so frustrating to make sense of how you feel and what is this what is telling you, because it sometimes can be so all over the place. So yeah, really good question. And uh, uh, just, you know, be watchful, pay attention to it and see what they're telling you. Question number five. Hi, Dr. Z. Thank you so much for your channel. You are so, so welcome. It has been helping to understand what has been happening to me. I very much had the floodgates open up and I am very grateful for your presence. If I lived in a state where you are available to practice, I would I would be contacting you right away. Yeah, you know, licensure rules only can do states I license it. I'm currently on waiting list to pro for a practice of gender specialists here in Maryland. But while I'm waiting, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about the reasons people may not experience a strong sense of dysphoria until later in life. It's always interesting when I pick questions how so many of them have so much in common. So here we have another one about dysphoria. In my experience, I believe I did not realize or had knowingly, unknowingly been pushing my feelings of dysphoria into the background. Did my brain begin to do this at a, at a young age? Like it was trying to protect me? As I got older, whenever I tried out more or expressed a desire to try femme things, they were discouraged or outright denied to me. I thought, well, that's just how it is. And I put it aside. The feelings of dysphoria grew and led me to use and sometimes abuse substances. That's very, very common. Uh, addictions are very, very common to cope with dysphoria, unfortunately. I understand now that one of the primary reasons that I have been using cannabis and alcohol, besides the fact that they are pleasant and enjoyable, let's be real, um, has been to quench the general discomfort I have been feeling ever since I was a teenager. Now that I understand that the feeling is dysphoria, it has become more localized, shifting around, revealing itself, getting stronger. The best, uh, the beast of, I call it beast too, I call it the beast, I call it the monster. The beast took a long time for it to burst out and it has, and, uh, and it has, and substances no longer work. I have to do the work of figuring out where I lie on the spectrum. I believe it is trans fam, but I wonder if I'm using the non-binary terminology as a defense, like maybe I'm afraid of admitting or don't desire to be trans woman. The binary is unappealing. How can I tell? What sort of questions should I ask myself? And what should I be asking the therapist once I got there? Again, thank you for your channel. I have learned so much and it has put me on a path to a brighter future. Thank you so much. I'm glad the channel is here to help all of you. That's exactly, um, I feel, my life mission. If I were to die today, I feel like that's what I was meant to do is to help this content. So you have a big question here. You have twofold question here. Question number one is what what is responsible? What causes? I apologize. I, I've been creating content today and that happens with my throat when I do. 
talk a lot so one is uh, how can it be what is responsible for dysphoria to come up at a later age was it there to protect me uh why didn't come out early and now is that the beast as you properly call dysphoria is out um you are using the non-binary spectrum identity you wonder if you're doing it as a defense and what questions to ask once you are in the therapist's office that can help you figure out where you land on the spectrum uh, this is a great, great question. I think a lot of people will be able to resonate with this question because a lot of you have either been through this or currently going through this. So one, the older you are, and I don't know your age, but the older you are, um, the, that just simply lends you uh, being a byproduct of growing up and having a childhood at a time uh, when we did not have this language vernacular we have today at a time when gender issues were not discussed openly on TV as they are today, uh, where we did not have a lot of advocacy, uh, where very little was known. There was no YouTube, I bet. <laughs> there was no internet. Uh, there were no people like me talking openly as sharing information, uh, especially from professional viewpoint on gender dysphoria. Uh, listen, I was born in 1980, and even, even that is, you know, way way worldly differently than what we're experiencing today so the older you are uh, the more you are um, situated within the historical context where not only there was no language but you're situated in historical context where your parents your caregivers also did not have knowledge because they your parents your caregivers were even older than you are when you were born and therefore they grew up and they were a byproduct or even more I would say gender ignorant times. Okay, let's let's call it for this gender ignorant times. Um, history constantly teaches us and educates us about us as humanities, and um, there's a long trail of history of a lot of gender ignorance. And because your parents were a byproduct of gender ignorance, they also didn't know. They were a byproduct of a strongly imposed heteronormative values and strongly imposed heteronormative views to the point where about your parents um, may have even had beliefs and values that homosexuality is bad or sin or, or mental illness, depending how old they were when uh, they had you. So you can see how historical context affects not only you, but also your caregivers. Because everything is situated within the historical context, for people who are older right now experiencing dysphoria, it makes it that much more challenging because it means you grow up during the time where any way the child you tried to uh, show any element of who you are was probably forbidden. And uh, your parents probably, uh, whether they consciously or unconsciously, would try to stray you back to heteronormative, uh, stereotypically male or uh, female uh, ways of behaving, ways of um, of being ways of expressing yourself and as a result this is where so much of repression happens this is why I constantly say it's it is very common for older adults to suddenly see something hear something um, to unleash all of that regressed material to come to the surface but it's always has been there. It's not like one day you just wake up suddenly and you're like, hey, I'm trans. No, it's you wake up one day and you're like, oh my God, now I have a language to understand what I already have been feeling throughout my history. For that reason, when you say, was it a way to protect yourself? Or some people, it was a, a defense function where the psyche is also protecting you because the psyche knows that back then, you just didn't have resources to do anything about it, nor was it perhaps even safe to do anything about it. Um, so don't feel like you need to have that classic narrative I knew since I was four years old and I was gender bending and uh, a lot of people, the older you are, uh, you may not even have that narrative and that's that's fine too. Now, your other question to now as the floodgates you said have opened, which by the way, if you haven't seen, I have a great video on the floodgates opening. Now that open and the beast, the dysphoria is out. And now you're starting to realize I have to do something about it because all of those coping things you use don't work. And that's anybody who's coping right now. This is an example. Coping is a band-aid. Eventually you will bleed. Eventually it all doesn't work because it's not meant to work. You cannot fully keep something. You cannot keep who you are ever hidden. Eventually who you are always comes to the surface. So now floodgates are open. Of course, no amount of cannabis or alcohol going to work. 
and uh, now you're wondering what to do about it. So one of the reasons why you you may be, and not just you, but a lot of people may dance around non-binary identity when they're really not. I want to be careful here because some people, they realize and they're like, oh, I'm non-binary. For some people, it is also kind of a stepping stone to a more to a more um, trans masculine or trans feminine identity and sometimes it could be because it feels more comfortable because it's overwhelming to acknowledge that you're a trans woman or trans man and with that acknowledgement comes maybe all this idea so what you think you ought to do now so in order to help you not feel so overwhelmed and so flooded, uh, it's common for people to, as a defense, without even realizing, to kind of, okay, maybe non-binary first. And that's okay, too, uh, because you're still exploring and you're gender banning and you're non-conforming and you're trying to figure out within the spectrum of where you land. For people, especially who have a history of substance abuse, as a way of coping, alcohol, uh, drugs, weed, um, any kind of um, substances that just numb your feelings, they're all called feeling numbing substances. The longer you've been abusing the substances, the longer you've been avoiding relationship to your feelings. So once you stop abusing substances, what happens is that it may take you a while to get in touch with your feelings, or your feelings may suddenly all kind of tumble uh, out of you and it can be overwhelming to sort out what it feels so as a result it also may feel more comforting to stay in non-binary identity camp until you start feeling a little bit more firm a little bit more comfortable i'm excited and i'm glad to hear that you are on a even though it's on a waiting list to see a gender specialist in maryland um, what questions to ask uh, yourself and would be asking therapists once you got there. The therapist, especially if they're gender therapists, should know what to ask you. Anybody who works with me knows that I ask a lot of questions. I'm very direct and to the point. And um, even though the therapist may not be as direct and to the point as I am, they will be, they should specifically talk about gender issues because that's what you're there for versus talking about something else. So don't worry about it. You you will be with the right person. Um, for you, what I would recommend for you because of what you described, floodgates being opened, uh, feeling overwhelmed, realizing the coping mechanisms don't work, trying to figure out where you land on a spectrum, being afraid that you may be all the way trans femme, I would recommend pace yourself. When things have been repressed for a long time and the floodgates open, it's it's akin to finding yourself in very deep waters without you know a safety um, safety vest on, and so you just want to really pace yourself. You want to slow down, take a deep breath, acknowledge this is a good thing that this has finally came to the surface. So now you can look at it. Remember, if we don't know what we're dealing with, we can't address it. We can't then find solutions. But so tell yourself, now that I know that I'm dealing with dysphoria, I can start taking baby steps. Remember, you don't have to, this is not a marathon. You don't have to run today uh, to the finish line. Start taking little, little steps and start taking care of yourself. Start substituting the unhealthy coping with the healthier coping. Instead of drinking in order to cope with the feelings that come to the surface, see if you can go for a walk. See if you can do things that are more healthy and more productive in the long term. So that's what I would recommend. Face yourself. And I think once you do start the therapy, uh, especially with the gender therapist, I think think things should clarify relatively quickly and you should get answers relatively quickly so i wish you all the best really really good question uh, and a very common one your position where you're feeling how you're dealing with it and the questions you have are all incredibly common so already normal um yeah so i wish you all the best and uh, keep us all posted and final question for today question number six First, I wanted to say I really appreciate your empathy and compassion towards people who are questioning their gender, struggling with dysphoria and going through transition. I am I am so for all of you, uh, completely. My heart is completely all out on table for all of you. I'm also grateful for the online content your and your book. They have been helpful. I'm so glad. My question is, why now? I am assigned male at birth in my late forest and I have been living, presenting, and identifying as trans woman for two years now. I love myself more than I ever have. Every step I have taken so far, coming out, social transition, name change, tracheal shave, has made me so much happier. I already want to answer your question. Why not now? Look how much happier you're describing yourself to be. Why the fuck not now? I'm, it's, it's amazing how you're describing yourself. 
I'm looking forward to studying Horms, but it's a long process where I live. I feel conflicted having to prove that I have always been transgender to the state's psychological evaluation, evaluators. It causes feelings of both doubt and regret. And I really, am I really trans if I didn't play with dolls, etc., etc.? Why didn't I realize sooner? After all, I can remember questioning my gender as young as four. There has been so many cues. But then I have lived as a man for most of my life. How do I reconcile that? I'm someone who didn't follow the I always knew since I was a child narrative. So I could use some of that support so that I can use some of the force. Sorry, I can't speak uh, support in that. So, okay. Uh, I always say this, the proof is in the pudding. And you just gave us all so much pudding. Let me read it again. I'm assigned male at birth in my late 40s and have been living, presenting, and identifying as trans woman for two years. That's a long time. I love myself more than I ever have, pudding. Every step I have taken so far, pudding, coming out, social transition, name change, trickle shape, pudding, 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 has made me so much happier, more pudding. The proof is in the pudding. That's all I got to say. Um, I know you're nervous. I know you hormones are important for not only psychological, but for additional changes. And I don't know where you live. Sounds like maybe abroad where they have a very rigid criteria. Um, I, I, here's... I'm not going to tell you something not right thing to do. Uh, you know, you should be honest. Um, I really hope that providers in your state have an understanding that not everybody has a childhood narrative of gender dysphoria. I really hope that they had seen a lot uh, of gender diverse individuals that don't fit that pattern to have realized and learned that that pattern is not applicable to all. I hope. Um, it is not uncommon that people, this is where people in the past had to lie. Historically, people in the past had to lie to providers to get access to care, to care because of such gatekeeping criteria as somebody having a stupid, uh, completely stupid list uh, that says childhood gender dysphoria, age four or five, check, played with um, toys of opposite gender check wanted to you know all of this wants to mutilate their genitals check it's very archaic it is very um let's just say we have come a long way um in learning and understanding gender dysphoria at least here in the united states at least let me speak for myself um so i really hope that the the you get a provider that is is knowledgeable Having said that, that's exactly what messes with people's headspace and gives people mind swap. When people feel, start feeling like, what's going on here? Why is it that sometimes I feel I'm taking all the steps that make me feel so affirmed and so confident, and yet at the same time, the minute I think about not having the childhood marriage, I start wondering, am I on the right track? It's going to start messing with your head. So don't allow it to mess with your head. Go back to square one and ask yourself, is the proof in my pudding? And you gave us all so, so much pudding. Oh my God. I don't think I ever said word pudding that many times in my entire life, but you gave us lots of pudding, 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 pudding. And oh my God, I, I love banana pudding. And I just want a banana pudding. You gave us a lot of, of pudding. All right. So um, obviously for two years, lots of things you've taken without even being on hormones have felt so incredibly affirming to you. That is your truth. There's your life experience. There's nothing like life experiences um, to really drive the point home. So I really wish that things are going to go with you. Hopefully they do. And I really hope that uh, it's not going to mess with your head. And I really hope you start trusting yourself and trusting your inner company. 
So that's what I would recommend. Anybody else, please chime below and share your suggestion recommendation. Thank you, everybody, so much for your wonderful and vulnerable questions and being able to share with everybody else your struggles and your challenges and trusting me in being able to provide some form of guidance, even though sometimes I can't give you full answers. Um, really appreciate that very much. And thank you so much, everybody. And I will see you all next time.